So let me now open up to the floor um, to hear your comments and questions to the panelists. We have about uh, 20 minutes, I believe, here. 25 minutes. Yeah, we'll first start in the back. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much for the very interesting presentations. My name is Anu Jukon, and I'm the executive director of Demo Finland. Political parties of Finland for democracy. So I especially enjoyed the Professor Nick Cheeseman's, <laughs> Cheeseman's uh, take, quite probably take on the working of the democracy support. And I, I would like to challenge that a bit because, as we know, only less than 10% of the development funding goes to democracy support, out of which, from my point of view, way too much has gone to the election support. And when you look at the political party support, it's less than a percent. And this links up quite nicely what what uh, Vanessa, uh, Verena Fritsch was saying about the silo between developing economics and economists and well, economics altogether, as well as um, democracy support. Because I think the political parties have been the forgotten stakeholder altogether in the development uh, sector as a key key entity for any country's development, as well as um, yes, as well as. Um, obviously working or not working towards the democracy. And this came up nicely also at the World De uh, uh, Development Report of the World Bank. And especially I'd like to point out from that report, the work of uh, senior researcher Philip Kiefer from the World Bank, because he's, uh, he went through hundreds, I think it was over 400 uh, loans by World Bank. And he, he's, uh, according to his academic research, the key uh, success was for the successful public sector reform was the programmatic political parties. If the country had those, the public sector reforms were more likely to be, highly likely to be successful. So I do have a question. Um, uh, Professor Cheeson, it would be interesting to hear, where do you see the multi-party support in this scenario? Um, though I understand that your talk was very much focused on the elections, but um, yes, it would be lovely to hear your views on that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. We had another question. I'm Juhari from the University of Helsinki. I was quite intrigued by this idea that what is the problem now is the conflation of democracy and governance. And that's the, that, that's the thing which is now the creating problem. But I'm not really sure if, this, if they can be separated. Uh, the World Bank has, has been all, uh, that made it a little best to keep these things separate, even, even they haven't succeeded. I you mean, you have to have a very strange definition of political thing, but the world bank's work is it's not political, and certainly, certainly in their own government, in, in its own government interest, they have this, uh, 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 this old person accountability. Mm -hmm. So, but uh, having said this, I would like to be a little bit devil's advocate and say that perhaps, perhaps we shouldn't be too worried or lament too much about the decline of democracy aid and governance aid or, you know, or its stagnation, if, only if, if it reflects the realization that this sort of aid doesn't seem really, really be working and, um, and it is something, uh, things like democracy and governance are something which cannot be imposed from outside in no way, and certainly, certainly not by now, I'll buy it conditionally. Historically, historically if, you can, if you look at how institutions develop, they, they, they took a very long time to develop. They, you know, they emerge for, for one reason, then they change, they change their function, function on the web. That's something, that's something which is extremely difficult or, or impossible for outsiders to affect. Mm -hmm. But if this is a the case, then I think we shall run, run into problems that when we try to promote democracy for democracy's sake. Mm -hmm. Because it leaves, leaves out the question, whose democracy? Which democracy? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll take these two uh, here first. Oh, sorry, that's okay. Uh, Olga Lubin, the University of Tampere. I would also go, I think that's, that's Well, we, it's that being that recorded, so we appreciate if you use uh, the microphone. I really prefer without microphone. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Um, um, yeah, so going back to the, um, to the two silos, uh, I think I think it's a very important point here because um, also going back to the first presentation, um, I would like to urge you, really, if we make a statement, if we urge people to promote democracy 
you know, for the sake of democracy, it's probably a very similar point. Um, there needs to be a very clear um, theory of change. And you've talked about, as I said, the theory of change. We have many theories of change, but as in how do we get to um, how do we get to democracy? But um, um, there are many ways. Um, maybe we shouldn't invest in democracy. Maybe, as we all know, as in, it's not a new point. Maybe we should invest in, in poverty reduction. Um, also, we should not confuse human rights and democracy. They're, these are two very different points. Um, and in the end, we're here to talk about development and um, aid may be about development, it may not be about democracy. So, um, in, in, in the relation to this, I also have a question to Nick. What's the current DFID um, theory of change? As, in, as in we know that you know, investment in NGOs does not work greatly. Investment in technology is not a solution either. So, what's the current view uh, you know, of DFID on this? Okay, thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm Thank you. Um, it seems as if that uh, you have all concentrated on, develop on developing aid given to encourage democracy. And I'm wondering why you make that separation, although it's convenient for financial reasons. Because uh, I feel that um, the donors should actually be exemplary in the way they themselves practice democracy. And here, uh, I feel that they do not themselves practice democracy. And um, you, you, have a, you, you, you put up a statement which said, um, donors are, uh, have become complicit in fostering development in inverted commas without, without democracy. And the question was why? Now, in my opinion, the donors have institutionalized discrimination and poor democratic practices. And for this, I don't need to go far. I can pin it down to Finida, uh, Danida, NORAD, and CEDA, the so-called liberalized Nordic democracies. They do not practice democracy in the development assistance. Um, secondly, the other aspect is that we expect them to teach by example. Now, they have very little transparency in their decision making. They are discriminatory as well in their practices. Um, so, one point that arises here is why is aid given to undemocratic regimes? Why are undemocratic regimes in Africa, and for that matter even in Asia, allowed to dominate their undemocratic systems of government? And the answer to that that I can suggest is that is because international exploitation of these countries depends on having strong regimes which dictate on how they're going to sell their natural resources. Um, and so these are basically, could be construed as questions, or they can be construed as just remarks. But if anyone wants me to prove what I'm saying, I'm willing to take the challenge. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, I think we'll first take those first four questions. Um, I think one of those was directly addressed to uh, Nick, and then I think the others are quite quite broad um, and um, raise a lot of kind of philosophical issues as well, I think, about how we're, we're looking at democracy versus development assistance. So any of the other panelists who want to address those as well. Let's first start with Nick since he had uh, one directly addressed to him. Yes, on, uh, on uh, the party's point, yes, absolutely. I mean, I was talking more about elections because I knew that our first speaker was going to focus more on the democracy fallback. So I didn't... So I didn't want to focus too much on the same thing, which is why I tried to take a narrow approach. So that wasn't intended to suggest that we should be focusing exclusively on elections or that we shouldn't be focusing on those other areas. I agree with you about parties. And, you know, we go back to Tom Crothers' very important book on parties being the weakest link in new democracies in most parts of the world. 
And I think that's fundamentally true. And I think your point about the significance of more programmatic parties for a range of development outcomes is absolutely central. I think one of the things that is tricky is the question of how do we do that work? And of course, many governments shy away from supporting parties because it seems to be an infringement on sovereignty. To give you an example, you know, I was in Zimbabwe trying to design strategies that would strengthen the last Zimbabwean election. There's a serious question here. Do you try and design a program that strengthens party agents, but then you have to design a program that ZANU-PF will allow you to operate in a context in which you have opposition parties and very high levels of tension in a competitive election? And how do you design a program that is acceptable to all of the parties? And I think one of the ways in which organizations like yours, the Westminster Foundation, NIMD and others have an advantage is to be able to do party to party work, which doesn't have the label of being state to party work. And therefore, the sovereignty issue is slightly softer and can be managed. But of course, that means that we need to drive more money into that type of activity, but also develop better mechanisms to prove that that's effective so that that's a sustainable way of doing it. But I think that question about sovereignty is one reason why we've pushed for these more technocratic solutions, because they're easier to deliver, they're less problematic. But it doesn't mean that they're necessarily more effective. And I think one of the things I was saying is we need to not shy away from the hard work that needs to be done to make stuff work. Um, I was asked about Diffitt's theory of change. That's a very big question, and I'm not an expert on Diffitt. So, um, but what I would say, having done a lot of work with Diffid on political economy recently, is Diffid's argument would perhaps be we don't have one theory of change, that it is inappropriate to have one theory of change, that almost all the work in political economy analysis that's been done in the last 10 years has been focusing on more adaptive models, more reflective models, models that are more context-specific, models that go with the grain rather than against the grain, but in very specific ways, models that are not based simply on working through institutions and saying let's build a stronger legislature simply by working with the legislature and having a theory of change around that but let's build change by forming coalitions that allow us to overcome obstacles and veto players and generate sufficient consensus and those coalitions for change can only be identified on the ground in a case-by-case -case, even sector-by-sector -sector level and I think you know that's not a very satisfying answer in the sense that there's no one-size-fits-all model but if we know anything from the last 20 years, is that there is no one-size-fits-all solution. So I think in some ways what DIFID is trying to do by pushing into more adaptive programming and more responsive programming is really good. I think the challenge, and I think DIFID would recognize this themselves, is that it's easy to say that, but it's very hard to implement that. Because actually on the ground, people are still used to working in the old way, and it's hard to actually introduce something that's more challenging or revolutionary. Just a very quick question on, on the democracy and, and why should we see it as being significant. I mean, at my point would be, if you look at the last 30 years, the consistently highest growing countries in Africa are the more open political countries. They're not the authoritarian states. Authoritarian states in Africa have achieved high levels of growth for short periods of time and then crashed. That was true in the 70s and 80s, and it's also looking true for countries like Ethiopia in terms of having to reconfigure the political system. So to me, the lesson of history in Africa is that you can grow very quickly, faster than a democracy with an authoritarian system, but you cannot sustain that for 20 years. The way to sustain that is to build a more inclusive political system. And that doesn't have to be a democracy. It might be a different form of system. It might be a more inclusive version of a one-party state. It might be something else. But it has to be more inclusive. So the systems that we see that now in places like Angola, Rwanda, Ethiopia, to me, do not look politically sustainable in the long term. And if they're politically not sustainable, the economic gains they are achieving will not be sustainable. So the Ethiopia case is really fascinating because the question is here, this became a politically unsustainable system. They're trying to simultaneously do now political and economic reform. And I agree with you, the economic strengthening will probably make that political reform easier to do. But the success of that long-term economic reform will now depend on managing this political situation. And I believe that Rwanda will face the same challenge in the next 10 years as well. And so what that all means if we add all that up is that actually paying attention to how we generate more effective open political systems is critical to long-term economic gains. So whether you care about democracy for its own sake or whether you care about it for long-term economic development, I think you end up at the same place. We have to get this right. Hmm. So let me be really quite brief. I mean, there is a lot of um, work on, on this re overall relationship between governance and growth and then within governance what really matters. And perhaps just the one point that I would flag 
I don't, you know, I agree very much with Nick that there isn't a unified theory of change, I think. But perhaps, you know, there may have been in the past that expectation that democracy was instrumental to growth or other um, developments. And I think what I would perhaps propose is that improving governance in how rules are made and how things function in the economy is has a benefit to democracy. So if you can get functioning institutions, it makes it easier to then at some point build a functioning democracy. If you don't have that, then it's probably very hard. And that comes back to my earlier point that probably the 1990s was a very difficult uh, moment in time to actually uh, begin a democratization in Africa and to make that successful. But the challenge is that there are a number of countries, and that's why we worry so much about fragile states where governance is just overall very, um, very poor, very chaotic, very captured. And how to move out of those situations, I think, is going to be a key puzzle uh, for the next 20 years for the overall development community. Um, so I think I maybe I almost want to apologize for I, sh I maybe I should have spent three more minutes in my presentation so you know to maybe uh, make it a little bit more clear. Uh, I think I'm going to be very clear on what I mean by democracy, and there are very very many forms of democracy, and it is it's going to develop over history over time, and it is a domestic issue. But a democracy has two components. There is contestation over power. The, who has power? There's a competition from, you know, in order to obtain power. There has to be, which includes freedom of association, freedom to form bodies, freedom to compete in election. So that's the number one. The second part, which is the part that gets left out, in, especially around Europe these days, uh, is rule of law. Contestation is really very weak and nothing without rule of law. And these two components, rule of law and contestation, has to be present. That, how the composition comes about, the party system, you know, how this, you know, how this works out, that is, a, that is something that cannot be designed. I totally agree. But this is what I mean by democracy. Why do I think it's important that we separate the concepts of governance from the concept of democracy. First of all, what I talk about rule of law, there's a, that's governance. Of course, everything you talked about, that's part, part of rule of law. But it goes back to what Nick was saying in his, uh, in his presentation. The fact that this com concept became so wide, you know, with World, World Bank, with its legal uh, statutes, not being able to touch anything that looks like politics, that concept became so all embracing that you know you can put anything into it, and 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 that is the problem because you put anything into the concept and then you blame it on democracy in the end. And so I really want to back to the first question you said, uh, the first commentator, democracy aid is only ten percent, and even that a lot of it goes to securitization, and political party support is like a, you know a fraction of that. So that, that's just really important. That, but I, I think it's just why, that's why it's, to me, <coughs> while the world outside cannot dictate what a democracy is, look, is supposed to be like, it has to have those two components. And then countries would have to sort that, you know, how. The last thing I wanted to say, uh, there are so many things I wanted to say, but, uh, and I think I just really want to second what uh, Rina said in her introductory comments. Maybe the 1990s was the worst time of all to actually try to start because it was at the same time that the inter international world was quietly dismantling states. That was a big project, and so, and, and that is a problem, and that is something we need to think about. And and this, you know, we may have actually sort of lost a chance when there was a very very uniform and kind of an almost a sort of uni a strong belief for a time in, in democracy. If we had a very bad situation to carry it out. So I, I just think, I really want to second that I think a lot of democracy support, do, we need to separate it. It should happen, it should, it should be organized differently. I think donors, bilateral go governments, should get themselves out of this. Because it, in, 
inevitably they end up supporting the sitting government. It's really hard not to. That's part of diplomacy. So NGO funds, party funds, media funds, like you, that is a way for governments to separate themselves. And it is to me a way of getting into more kind of independent semi-state institutions that can overlook this, to actually sort of be able to create these watchdogs. An underrated institution that I have a strong affinity for is the Ombudsman. And I, you know, so I, that's one of the things that we could think about in the future. Maybe uh, three uh, quick points. First, um, support for authoritarian regimes. You are right. If you go back to the 90s, for example, I just take two examples, France and the USA. Two countries in Africa, Zaire uh, for the USA and uh, Togo for France. They were not doing well at all at the time when all the real countries in Africa were trying to democratize, but they received more aid than maybe the good um, uh, guys uh, like Benin or maybe not Benin, because Benin is a different case, but other countries uh, that are democratizing. So I think you are right. Second, now I think in the democratization studies you have more and more uh, stuffs coming up about uh, authoritarian resilience. For example, I don't know if you know Levitsky and Waste Book or Eva Benin's work on the Arab states. Why these Arab states continue to be supported by countries like the US? So it's, uh, it has something to do with national interest, so I think you are right. Second, why does democracy matter? I think, and, and uh, um, maybe I will go further, Nick said that you can achieve a, a, some kind of economic success with an authoritarian regime, but you have to find another way. I think in Africa these days, there is no other way than a democratic system. Because if you look at the Afrobarometer, for example, surveys, what you see is that there is the African societies are eager to democratize it. They want freedom. So it's very difficult, for example, in countries like Rwanda or Ethiopia, where the, the, all the seats in the National Assembly are uh, for, for the, 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 the ruling party. It's, I think it's very difficult to sustain something like this. At one point or another, pluralism should uh, be implemented. And second, um, can democracy be imposed from outside? I think yes. There are two questions here. You can, if you look back to the second, what uh, Huntington termed the wave of democratization, the second wave of democratization, following the Second World War, Japan and countries like that, you can. But if you want democracies to be sustained and consolidated, you need to look inside. In consolidation and sustainability in the long run is a matter of internal affairs. So I think you have, if you make this distinction, maybe it can clarify a little bit the the, the question. And um, finally, about the World Bank, I think, I don't know, maybe you can correct me, but it's true that the World Bank is not supposed to do politics, but if you go, I think it's the World Bank that issued this report in 1989 called uh, Sub-Saharan Africa from Crisis to Sustainable Growth, where the term governance came in. And they said, governance is not only the way to manage like economic affairs, but also institutions that are able to support this and when you talk about this it means pluralist institutions and then you know it's very difficult to separate the two so the, the world bank is not supposed but in, i think in practice what some of the the, the things they do like the, the idea of governance goes back to politics also I think, unfortunately, uh, we do have to end it there. Um, but of course, please do uh, come and ask your questions to the to the panelists bilaterally. I'd like to thank you for attending today and definitely to, to thank all our panelists for, I think, a really thought-provoking session today. <laughs>